Yeah. However, I've also come across something in my research where people within the subculture can have trouble either giving or accepting help for reasons which I think I'll explain. And these are things which harm reduction services can maybe consider when they're trying to reach people. So moving on, um, this is based on two pieces of research I did. One of them was for a conference about extraordinary and spiritual sort of experiences. And it was focusing on that kind of experience in the context of festivals. So I did some of my own interviewing for this, um, getting narratives from people about these things that had happened to them. And secondly, there was a set of interviews which were collected by someone else, um, Sarah Riley at the University of Aberystwyth, who was talking to free party people about their experiences at parties and events and where they stood on drugs and drug harm and the kind of experiences you can have. So with all that said, we move along. That's the nice image that was supposed to be up there while I was talking to you. So my own way into this was um, it's good in this kind of social research at the moment to kind of pin your colours to the mast and say what your allegiances are instead of pretending that you're looking at it from a great height where it's in a petri dish and you've got a white coat on and you're pretending to be an unbiased observer. Um, it's thought of these days as being more honest to say if you're deeply involved with a particular thing and that's why you're studying it. And with that in mind, my interest in this began because I used to go to festivals with a group of people who were very political about it. For example, they were very much into sort of alternative community, um, alternative lifestyles and environmentalism. And this for them was completely tied up with their festival experience and what they thought festivals were for. So as soon as I got onto my MA, I made straight for the sociology of festivals to try and see whether it showed if that was a common experience. But in fact, I found that most of it was really critical. Um, say, for example, Theory of Rave kind of uh, had a run of bad luck or started out at an unlucky time because it sort of appeared, or rave culture appeared at a moment just when talking about subcultures as being good for, t for causing change in, in, in society had fallen out of fashion and instead everybody was talking about how subcultures had no potential for social change at all and it was all just consumption and it was all pointless. So a lot of the early theory of rave was like this. And in particular, they thought of as festivals, or they thought of festivals as being like a safe, kind of socially approved little pocket of rebellion in which you could go and do your rebellious thing and dream that another world was possible and blow off some steam and then come back and be a good little worker next week. So you've got this lovely quote from Barbara Ehrenreich um, talking about how, how festivals were seen in the 1700s that they were a nice way of giving a little prize to maids so that they would then go home and do their work happily with a light heart and be more obedient to their supervisors or their superiors. So that's very much how a lot of the theory that looks at the politics of festivals saw it. But alongside, there's this other strand which focuses more on kind of festivals as religion and the act of taking psychedelics in a field as primarily religious and sort of radical in a way because of that. Um, because it's almost like a creation of a ritual space where the rules are different and a lot of social expectations are temporarily relaxed and you get explicitly built sacred spaces. I'm going to be showing you a beautiful one of those in a minute. Um, and some, some of the theorists think that if you have a safe space like that, where you can play with oppressive power dynamics in society, then you don't take them so seriously when you come home. Like at Glastonbury in 2007, I was walking along and I found this massive tree trunk which had been sawed and put flat so that it was shaped like a table, like a long dinner table. And there were all these people sitting around it in beautiful business suits with immaculate hair and, you know, pencil skirts and jackets and clipboards and they had a flip chart, and they were, running up to, they were running up to people going, you're missing the board meeting, what are you doing, you're late. <laughs> and that's the kind of 
I feel that that's kind of spiritually akin to the kind of festivals they had in medieval times where a beggar would be dressed up as king for a day and this was messing around with the ideals of feudalism and monarchy and so on. So we put ourselves in this space and we start to question things and it can be, it can start out new lines of thought which are not always approved of. Like you have people being quite disapproving of getting muddy and running around in the field um, doing the things that Levente was just describing. But I don't think we mind very much. Festival goers rebelling against self-esteem and personal dignity. Um, <laughs> it's nice to have a holiday from your dignity for a weekend, I think. Um, so this is where the religious aspect comes in because in this research that I did, I found that people were having really full-on spiritual experiences at festivals. They had different experiences of time and space, time behaved differently. They were having out-of-body experiences, they were having precognitive experiences like divination, things like tarot and so on, working uncannily well. Um, they were meeting God, they were getting sensory overload, they were detonating their egos. This stuff was happening all over the place. But um, Karen made an interesting point there, which I was going to mention, which is that the official festival organisers often have to try and disown or turn a blind eye to any use of psychedelics at the festival. And so you've kind of got this beautifully crafted space, which is kind of in an unspoken way made for psychedelic experiences, but people inside it are left to sink or swim. You know, they can't get any official help. And they may not want official help anyway. Oh yeah, this is just the space that, this is a, a space that was created at Sunrise Festival last year. This is it being built. Um, that's it finished. And that's it in the daytime. There's a, fire, there's a fireplace in the, in the centre and the fire was kept burning at all times. You can see the pile of shoes where people were encouraged to respect the space by taking their muddy boots off. And this is it at night because all the beams had lighting effects inside them which changed colour constantly throughout the night. And it was not explicitly a harm reduction space but it always had dry straw and it always had a calming atmosphere. And it was a place where you could come to just get away from all the mud and rain and craziness and catch your breath for a little bit. But it was never explicitly described as a space to have psychedelic experiences in because the organisers weren't allowed to say that. So, what am I doing? Yeah. So then when you have a difficult experience, as you sometimes have, as Levente was describing and the others were describing, um, these are some examples of things that happened to my participants. Um, I was swallowed by a dance floor once, etc. Um, a lot of them involving feelings of being very alone. Um, as we know, this often means material that it's worth working through and that you might be able to get to the end of and then integrate and find out something useful about yourself. But in the case of these people, they didn't have any tools to integrate with. Um, well, participant DQ did. You'll see more of him in a few minutes because he was my first harm reduction story. Um, but the others didn't have anywhere to go and didn't really have any help in the experience. And for them, the festival environment was quite a chaotic, churning, sort of upsetting place to be while they were having those experiences. Um, and then there is, um, yeah, again, I was very struck by what Karen was saying about the doctors. Um, going for official help can feel like a very difficult step to take. Well, partly because the information that they give you doesn't seem trustworthy, because we've all been told at school that as soon as you smoke a spliff, you'll wake up and you'll be shooting heroin into your eyeballs under a bridge uh, before you know it. And then when that doesn't happen, you start, to, you start to question all the information that you've been given, and it all seems to be non-credible. Um, there's the pathologization problem, where a lot of official harm reduction initiatives require that you accept this view of the addict as patient. And that assumes two things, that you're an addict and that you're a patient. And I think most drug users at festivals wouldn't really think that about themselves. Um, there's the kind of the AA atmosphere, where in order to seek official help, you have to first admit that you have a disease and you're powerless, and you're never going to do it again. And under those circumstances, you can ask for help. 
So we have a quote there saying, it looked a bit medical and I'm not a fan of doctors. I was very happy to hear about Karen going in and yanking people out of the um, official medic's tent and saving them from the high-vis jackets and the bright light and all the rest of it. So medical services tend to be really underused for that reason. Um, I've got, yeah, I've got, a, I've got a slide about with the cosmic care space, which Tracy kindly said I could use. Um, that's the way you guys work has been descri described really eloquently by you already, so I'm going to slightly speed on through this um, until we come to the integration section at the end. Um, but the point is that you can have a lovely, welcoming, tolerant harm reduction space and people can still have trouble using it or presuming that they're the sort of people who can help in it for the reasons that, I'm, that I discovered in the second piece of research. Right. This is where we move on to the free party interview data set. And I started analysing these interviews. I had a grounded theory approach, which means that I was trying to keep an open mind. And I didn't want to go into it with too many preconceptions. I wanted to let the data speak for itself. So I didn't actually read her conclusions until I'd done my own analysis. And what I was amazed by was how important community and mutual support and responsibility was to the free party people. But there was this strange thing where they used almost cold, harsh, militaristic language. Um, the sort of language that you might expect to hear from a strict teacher or something about people controlling their own drug use. That it's all on you to learn to self-regulate. Um, it's, it's, it's down to you to get it under control. You have to make your mistakes and run into a brick wall and find out that it's really bad and back away and get hold of it. And one of the participants, Alice, actually used the term good soldiers. Um, you can imagine a sort of a drill sergeant shouting at these people to get a grip of themselves, where everything else they say is all about tolerance and peace, love, unity and respect and all the rest of it. So you've got the same kind of... Sorry, do I have 10 minutes extra because of... Um, yeah, five, because of the... You, you I'll see if I can, yeah. So you've got the same problem on the other side where people don't feel like they can offer help or comment on someone's drug use because there's this kind of personal freedom that is sacrosanct. Like the first quote there, he's, it, it's talking about how it's taboo to criticize anyone's drug use or comment on maybe even like advise them not to take any more out loud. Um, all you can do is pray for a person or some people have surprisingly harsh ideas that you should have to have a license to take drugs or a permit but all the same they would never actually try and like tell a friend that maybe they've had too much ketamine because that's kind of deeply taboo. So you get this impression of a festival space or a party space where everything is tolerant and trying to be safe and trying to encourage these experiences but managing your problematic drug use is something you have to do alone and no one is going to help you nor should you nor should they. And my first theory about why this is happening is because if you have reached the point of thinking that taking psychedelics is a good thing, for example, you've probably had to sort of push yourself away from the standard cultural narrative. You've probably had to go through a period of not trusting it. And you, might, you, you eventually find your tribe where they um, are tolerant of what you do and, the, and then you're delighted. But then any attempt to moderate each other makes you sound like the mainstream. It makes you sound like them. Uh, concern from Berkshire was the word that the, the term that kept coming up, or Berkshire, um, in the free party data. There were a bunch of other ones, like the Saturday night pisshead was shorthand for a mainstream person. And if you're trying to tell people not to, to take psychedelics, you're going to sound like one of them. Um, I've seen the same thing in other deviant groups, like completely different deviant groups where the deviance is something else, um, like people with unusual sexual practices. Um, say someone is being abusive within that community, it can be very hard for others to say so because it makes you sound like the Daily Mail and no one wants to sound like the Daily Mail. 
So, going ahead. This is, um, this however was Sarah Riley's idea about why this is happening. Um, she thought that the whole rhetoric of personal freedom was not countercultural. She thought it was from the dominant cultural narrative. It's this philosophy of, which originally comes from a economic theory or a free market economic theory, neoliberalism, but it gets applied to individuals as well. It's this view of yourself as you're the CEO of your own brand. You're competing with other people. You are the one with all the power over your own destiny. Social forces don't affect you. Um, this is like a straightforward rip-off of kind of new age or psychedelic ideas that your thoughts shape reality, but used in a really cynical way. Um, and self-expression is all about what you buy from a choice of products. And everybody is kind of fundamentally alone because the whole world are your competitors. And so here we've got one of the party people who expresses freedom as the ability to choose from several different parties that are going on at the same time, as if she was buying a pair of trainers or you know, a particular brand of beer off a shelf. And that's, it seems, that's what Sarah Riley thought freedom meant to her. But simultaneously in the data, you've got this completely different view of freedom where it's intimately tied up with support networks and connection and communication and responsibility and protecting the party. It's almost freedom to belong. Um, they kept saying the same thing about how much they hated nightclubs for two reasons. And this was because you couldn't do what you wanted because you were constrained in a little box and because you couldn't talk to people. So freedom was intimately intertwined with the ability to communicate and to make connections and to talk to each other freely. And it was the conformist world that was identified with isolation. So, yeah. So we've got a sort of a, a longing, spoken or unspoken, for this kind of ritual space in which people come together freely to do something quite structured. So how this relates to harm reduction projects, it seems like the idea that you can't get help with your drug use seems like it might be a barrier to some people to going and seeking help from a harm reduction service. Because in neoliberalism, if something goes wrong for you, it means you've, you've personally failed. Because if you shape your reality, then all your misfortunes are your fault. So you've almost failed to be a good soldier. So there needs to be maybe a recognition that people may feel ashamed that they couldn't handle whatever it was that they took. Or they might be embarrassed to ask for help, or they might feel that they'd, they were a lightweight or something else. But also, this determination to handle it alone, which may certainly not be the best idea. Um, the participant here, for example, thinks that like, if she really needed it, she might go if they weren't busy attending to dire emergencies. She doesn't consider herself to be a, a dire emergency. Like, she doesn't necessarily deserve to be helped. So, the question is how to convey that a space is welcoming in that way and welcoming to all so that it gets past that shame and that isolation. And that, I think, is something to discuss at another time. But it seems that eventually there will be word of mouth if people come to tolerant spaces and discover that there is no shame, there is no blame, there is no directiveness. It is just literally a place for them to ride the experience out in the best possible way. Eventually that word will spread, but perhaps there may be lessons for ways to present the services to get past those blocks that people have. So I'm going to finish on a quote from one of my participants from the first piece. It's really long, I do apologise, but it shows it's, it's based at Boom, or it was, it's an experience from Boom with the Haven or the Sanctuary Tent. And at first he starts out feeling really alone and isolated and he's looking up at the stars and as he says it's Douglas Adams' total perspective vortex. If anyone's read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it's where you're looking up at the universe and you realise how tiny you are. And the experience for him was about, about feeling really all alone. And so he makes straight for the sanctuary tent 
and is talked through the experience, which he said was equivalent to a year of therapy, I think he said. And the reason that helped so much was because the sanctuary tent was there for a purpose to help people like him, and it gave him back that sense of belonging, which was the antidote to the isolation. And yeah, here we go. And this means that he came out of it having completely integrated the experience, or not necessarily completely, but he got a great deal out of it and was able to bring it home with him. Whereas I think a lot of people who have psychedelic experiences at festivals either try to forget it ever happened or rationalize it away and say that it wasn't important. And I think some of those people who dip their toe in the water and have a bad experience sort of draw back from altered states and anything countercultural and say, I've tried that, I didn't like it, I'm never going to do it again. So without integration, it can even be kind of conservative and not bring about any change. It can actually drive people away from that sort of experimentation. But with integration, it can be carried. I'm going to skip that. There's a little bit of T.S. Eliot. Yeah, um, if an experience is properly integrated, it can actually affect your politics and your attitude to social change. Um, this is a quote from Ren Butler, who was writing about Stanislav Grof's therapy in which you go through the basic perinatal matrices, um, which some of you may be familiar with, um, working through buried material from your birth. He thought that when you come out the other side, when you've worked your way through all the stages, these are the long-term effects. Um, some people think that it's just about becoming a navel gazer or becoming disengaged or not being interested in the rest of society anymore. But he includes things like being critical of abuses of power and being more motivated to deal with ecological issues and political issues and finding that this becomes quite a strong part of your identity. So I think that, finishing up, there was a last sentence there. Yeah, um, there were, I started with those two strands, which were the mystical and the political theories of festival sociology. But I think those don't need to be split because the mystical is political. And the more people have properly integrated experiences, the more politically engaged good citizens they can be. In that, I think there's immense potential for change. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>